Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Lisa Silverman. I'll be your facilitator for today. Today's webinar is on remote patient monitoring and why accreditation can actually improve patient care. I'm excited to be here today with our presenters, Lex Vogel from the UREC team. He'll be on in just a minute. Zach Fink, who is co-founder and CEO of Vitrack. They are our first accredited client for remote patient monitoring. We're thrilled to have him here. And our president and CEO, Dr. Sean Griffin. That, Lex, I'm going to turn the floor over to you to tell us a little bit more about UREC and our programs. Thanks, Lisa. I appreciate it. And uh, I love your outfit today. Looking great. Thanks. It's nice to be twins today. I uh, know. We're looking sharp. So welcome and good afternoon, everyone. I am Lex Fogel, and it's my pleasure to open the remote patient monitoring webinar. URAC has the distinct honor of being the preeminent digital accrediting authority, offering the only standalone accreditations for digital health. Before becoming a client, I'm your point of contact. We will work together to determine what accreditation or certification is best for your organization. Earning a URAC Gold Star reinforces your organization's commitment to the highest qualities of care. For over 30 years, URAC has been held in the highest regard by the healthcare community. This is because URAC is an independent accreditor. Our reviewers are all staff members with an average of 20 years of experience and we don't provide consulting services. Our flexible standards let your innovations demonstrate how you achieve excellence. URAC is at the forefront of digital health, offering several accreditations and certifications for health systems, hospitals, networks, providers, and innovators. Although digital health is elective, regulators, payers, and employers know the value associated with earning a URAC seal. More importantly, they're asking for it. Here's how the URAC accreditation process works. From the time you become a client, there's roughly a 90-day period before your organization submits its application. During that time, URAC's dedicated client relations team works with your organization prior to a URAC reviewer scoring the application. URAC's process is thorough and rigorous. After you submit your initial application, a URAC reviewer will follow up with requests for information if necessary. Then the reviewer will conduct a virtual validation review, which demonstrates the standards. Lastly, your application is redacted of all identifying information before it goes to the accreditation committee for final determination. All the digital health accreditations and certifications are valid for three years. And Lex, I was about to chat this in, but I want to say it's really exciting. We actually have some members of our review team on board here. So if you have specific questions about the review process and need to go a little more in depth as to what Lex talked about, we've got people on here and you can just chat those questions right into the chat box. Thanks, Lisa. And any questions that we don't answer today, we'll follow up with you within before the end of the week. So the URAC team has put together some great tools and amazing people to help you along the way. You'll have a dedicated client relationship manager who is on call to answer any of your questions. We'll give you a guide to your specific program and one for using our proprietary accreditation application system. And since we believe accreditation should be a learning process, you'll work with your reviewer on ways you can improve your program operations and ways you can set yourself up for further success. Here is a sample of some of our digital health clients. As you can see, a wide range of organizations recognize the benefit of being a URAC client from large health systems, medical technology companies, as well as mental and behavioral health providers. And it's exciting to have Vitrack with us here today. Our clients consistently tell us they value URAC accreditation or certification for the reasons you see on the screen. The standards for our program are developed by leading industry experts in the fields of technology and healthcare. Meeting these standards is something your organizations will celebrate. Sean, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you to start the conversation about the differences between URAC's telehealth and URAC's remote patient monitoring programs. 
Lex, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So uh, I'm the president and CEO at URAC, uh, talking to you today from Washington, D.C. My team always teases me that I talk about a sunny afternoon here in D.C., but it actually is a pretty sunny afternoon. Uh, URAC's digital health programs, when, when we started doing digital health and we looked at telehealth, uh, telehealth was its own area and it was emerging. And, and as the innovator in accreditation, we like to look at emerging areas and help to set the framework for what quality looks like. So among the telehealth accreditation, there's actually three different types of telehealth health. Uh, there is consumer to provider where the consumer reaches out to the provider to receive the care. Provider to consumer where the provider al already has a relationship with the consumer and this is part of an ongoing care relationship. And then there's provider to provider. This is classically the, the subspecialist who comes into a provider's office remotely and, and provides a consultation type services service. And, and, and when we looked at that, you know, there's standards within telemedicine. Back when I was a CMIO for, for a decade or two, I used to say that, that telemedicine was about getting the connection, getting the video connection. And now we know that there's so much more to care than just the technology. There's the whole program, not just the platform. And so within our programs, we have risk management standards, operations and infrastructure standards, consumer protection, performance monitoring, telehealth operations, patient encounters, clinical care, all these different things that make it a full program where good care is delivered via telemedicine or telehealth, depending upon which word you want to call it. As we were doing this and as we were a leader in that area, we recognized the, the various business models that were being used to deliver telemedicine. And, and there were a number of organizations that were doing all of the back end services except for providing the clinicians. And so we actually stood up a program called Telehealth Support Services Certification. This is where you're actually doing everything but bringing the clinicians. And, and you had clinicians who were saying, you know what? But we, we know we deliver good care in the office. If we're going to deliver good care remotely, we want to make sure that it's a good organization that we work with. So providers were saying they wanted an accredited organization to work with, and that's where telehealth support services comes from. When it comes to remote patient monitoring, remote patient monitoring is, I, I say this, and I'm probably a little off in my numbers, but 80% of telehealth you can take and transfer over to remote patient monitoring because quality is quality. Um, you know, consumer engagement and, and empowerment are consumer engagement and empowerment, uh, quality improvement, telehealth operations, technical aspects, all of those things come over from telehealth. But we have seen this just burgeoning of remote patient monitoring. And that's where our accreditation came from that is specific for remote patient monitoring. And as we look at uh, during the pandemic, there's been so much innovation in telehealth, but there's also been this remote patient monitoring, which has come along. And we, and we are thrilled that Vitrack with their, their innovation and their, their leadership is the first organization to go through our remote patient monitoring accreditation. Sean, thanks so much. I'm going to stop sharing uh, my screen because this is really about the conversation we're having here today. Um, so, Sean, I really appreciate that you gave us the official URAC definition. Um, I think of of separating our telehealth, telehealth support services from remote patient monitoring. Um, that's I think that's so important for level setting. And I also just want to say here um, that we love questions throughout the webinar. We do not hold off answering questions. I will interrupt Sean and Zach where needed to get your questions in. We don't want you to be lost about something or hear something and be kind of confused about the beginning and not get to it until the end. Um, and somebody asked their accreditation programs for international organizations. And yes, Jeff just chatted in and Sean's going to, Sean's like sitting here like a kid in class. So yeah. <laughs> Sean, you want to talk about our international accreditations? I, I appreciate that kind of the softball question. It was probably one of my friends who, who put that in. So, so we we were doing telehealth and telemedicine. And if, if you look at URAC, you know, we've been around for 30 years. We're trusted. We have government deemed programs, all those sort of things. Um, and we were doing such good work in telehealth and telemedicine that we had international organizations come to us saying, you know, we'd like to bring the, the American gold standard across the country. And so we are thrilled that we were invited to go overseas and to work with organizations, you know, in Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia, in, in all these different areas. And it, it was something where, where we believe that, that good practice is good practice. Um, and, and we contrast that to bad medicine on a good camera is still bad medicine. And so uh, we, we didn't look to go internationally. They asked us to come over. And, and we think it's, it's a really growing area that we've enjoyed working with people and understanding the particular uh, uh, rules that apply to their area of practice and making sure that they still have good quality no matter what their local rules are. So I just wanted to say that because it's a lot of fun to, to have to get invited overseas.
Yes. And Lex can talk to you all you want. Uh, and Jeff, both Lex and Jeff chatted and they're really excited about our national programs and are happy to chat with you about it. So Zach, you're in the remote patient monitoring space. We've heard a couple of times that you are first accredited client for remote patient monitoring. What does remote patient monitoring look like though in the field and when you're providing the service? I think you have a really interesting story as to how you came to it and seeing it from the real life level of you know how do we expand our reach through remote patient monitoring? Yeah, my, my background with remote patient monitoring goes way back before the Medicare codes came out. Uh, in my previous career, I was the executive director for a natural disaster relief organization. We're a nonprofit. And almost any community I would go to, whether it was a fire, hurricane, earthquake, fire, whatever it is, I would go there and I would ask them, what do you need help with? And almost every single time they would say, we, we need health care. And I remember for Hurricane Maria, we went to Puerto Rico to do a relief trip down there. Uh, and they kept asking us if we haven't had a doctor here in six months or a year, the roads were destroyed, we can't get a physician up here. And I lived in Philadelphia at the time, and I said, everyone on every corner is a doctor, a nurse, a medic. I'm going to bring down a whole hospital with me. It's going to be amazing. Very, very optimistic. And I got back and I started talking to the doctors that I know, and they all had the same three questions. Uh, it was, where are we sleeping? What are we eating? And how much am I getting paid? And I said, well, it's volunteer. You're going to be eating cliff bars. You're going to be sleeping in an abandoned church, to which they all very quickly went, oh, no, we're not coming. So I went, oh, no, what do I do? How do I still provide medical care, really good quality medical care, without bringing down the provider? So I got introduced to telehealth and remote patient monitoring by trying to figure out a way to get really good care to an area where doctors don't have access to. So I'm happy to say that in two days, we saw over 125 patients completely virtually using remote patient monitoring and telehealth. So that was something that really informed my journey because now we're living in a time, not just with COVID, but most people don't understand that outside of your metropolitan area, if you even drive an hour or two hours, especially in LA, you are in a rural area, an area where someone can't just get to their doctor really easily or get an ambulance quickly or have really good proactive care constantly. So really we are living in a time when especially with COVID, everyone really is technically in a rural area right now. So that solution just kept evolving and evolving into what eventually became by turn. Awesome. Um, we love, we love hearing that. So tell me, uh, tell me a little bit more about what Vitrack does, um, yes. just who you are. So we just have that feeling there. Sure. So Vitrack is, uh, and, and I think this is true for a lot of the new way we're seeing the healthcare industry go, where it's not about a system of sick care anymore. So much of our system, the incentives are there for when you're already sick, when you're at the hospital and you need this procedure or you need this crazy medication for what you've done. For us, we're on the other end of that. It's about proactive health care. It's about keeping a patient healthy, monitoring them, and catching that very first moment their health starts to dip with some really good technology and looking at the puzzle in an interesting way. It's really easy to pinpoint that moment where the health starts to dip. And when you intervene there and you intervene in a really meaningful way, that is how you save lives. You stop the buck here, not when the patient's going to the hospital for their third teeth diabetic ulcer or their next amputation. In a time like 2021 with the technology we have and that level of oversight we can provide, no one should ever get that bad. And I think about this all the time in terms of hypertensive patients. I used to be a medic and I used to get patients in my ambulance all the time with the craziest blood pressure I've ever seen. Sometimes the machine would go like, error, what is happening here? Blood pressure doesn't work like that. It doesn't just go through the roof one night like that. Very rarely, most of the time it's gonna slowly build up to, get to, to getting that back. So if you can catch that here, you can genuinely save lives. So that's really why we, why we built Vitrack and why we're so passionate about what we do. Yes, Sean, I yeah, the, I, I'm chomping at the yeah, bit here. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, th those of you who know me know I train in rural family medicine in, in the state of Iowa, and that's what I thought my career was going to be. And there were times in residency where I was the only doctor in the county caring for people. And and I've been in the emergency room, and I've had people come in, and we've had to transfer them out and get care. And, you know, there's all these things with, with uh, telehealth for stroke care. Um, but but when, when Zach talks about that proactive sort of involvement, um, the, the analogy that I thought of just the other day when, when we were planning on this webinar is if, if you were to go down to Miami to the condo building that collapsed and go there a few years ago and you could see the wearing away of those concrete columns and you had a chance to intervene at that point, I think we'd all want to stop 
that situation before the building collapsed. And we have we have thousands of people across the country and around the world who right now their 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 heart is eating away at their blood vessels or their their diabetes is eating away at their kidneys. And and if you get that under control, you live a normal life. And 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 it, it may not be we don't fix the disease, but maybe we control it, we make it better, and we help people to live lives where they are with technology that's available. And this is just a, a, a fantastic new area. I've seen, you know, I was in Houston, Texas, where we were doing telestroke, where we were analyzing patients in the ambulance as they're headed to the emergency room, or we're, we're taking a look at the EKG as they're coming in and those sort of things. And and those are really great sort of moments of intervention, but it's it's the day in, day out with the high blood pressure. It's the day in, day out with the diabetes, where where you you are able to give this care to your loved ones, or to, or to give it to yourself to to help protect your family. That really pays off, and and technology has changed, and therefore our care must also. Sean, you know one of the things I've heard you say on other webinars and other settings is we have a sick care system, not a wellness care system, not a health care system. And I think you know when I'm hearing remote patient monitoring, I'm hearing getting us closer to that wellness care system and and towards achieving them for moving from health yeah. being a sickness element into a continuous health improvement well, I, I, th I think that's part of it. I mean, I think I think Zach and, and his his involvement in the past and going into disaster prone areas. I mean, this morning when I was getting ready to come into work, I'm looking at the, the hurricane down by Houston. It was literally over my neighborhood was where the eye of the hurricane was this morning when I was watching the news. Now, that's not where the rain was because the rain was off to the east. But we, we have seen so many natural disasters where you need to get care into an area where you where you couldn't. And, and this has a role there. And and I also I have a father who was in the hospital and they, they sent him home and he's he's still not fully well and there's there's monitoring that could be done there to keep him healthy and and we think of the children who who are maybe coming down with with croup at this time of year and having a pulse ox at home or seeing how they're doing you know those sort of aspects to keep a child out of maybe a a more covid -y environment in a hospital but they're getting the care that they need I, I think that we see this how it how it challenges the paradigms of sick care how it improves the opportunities for well care and we also think about you know those those, those deserts of care whether it be a disaster disaster area or a rural area or an underserved area sitting right next to downtown, whatever your city may be, there are places where this can fill in the gaps. And it doesn't just fill in the gaps in desperation, it fills them in with improvement. And that's really a, a tremendous thing to offer. And ju just on that point, I think, like you said, it's, it's not just for your everyday person who's at home looking to monitor their health. The changing the system from one of sick care to one where it's about wellness changes so many other parts of the industry. Like you said, it's about monitoring a sick kid at home. So when they're just leaving the hospital, making sure they don't need to go back to the hospital, even for a clinical trial, for example, how's this new drug affecting this person, getting, catching those moments when something is off applies to so many different kinds of industries. And that's, by the way, er the earlier you intervene, the better your yeah. outcomes will always be on the other end. So this is all about finding that moment and then it's not just about finding it, it's about intervening in that. So exactly like you said, this is going to change the entire industry. I've asked our audience, I really want to hear, so this is me asking not just our panelists, but really going back to the audience, we love audience participation, um, to tell us how they're seeing in the field, how they're seeing remote patient monitoring, support a health system geared toward wellness. What are some elements here? So uh, Jacqueline, I appreciate you said readmission mitigation. Um, Sean, you want to, I know you have thoughts on that. Well, when I was in Houston, Texas, we were we were doing population health and classic population health. We had five hundred thousand attributed lives, and what we discovered is is we had kits that when you were discharged from the hospital with with a congestive heart failure exacerbation, where you had your heart was not doing so good, and we we'd gotten you mostly better, but we need to keep an eye on you. We would send people home with kits, and they would include things like a blood pressure cuff and a scale, and 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 probably like an iPad. So we could talk to the patient, we could take a look at them, we could see see their vitals, see their weight and those sort of things. And and we were moving upstream to where we could improve the health so that they weren't in the hospital. And and organizations were going, I, I oh, I get it. I understand now how, how I can do that. And when, when the focus is on getting paid for an episode of illness, as opposed to maintaining a time of wellness, it, it changes things. And, and, and we know that, I mean, there, there are some people who just for their own sake, 
can invest in their health. There's other people who, because of the costs associated with when they get really sick, the system says it's worth it for us to keep them as healthy as possible. And and, and we're seeing that, and we're seeing that innovation. And one of the things that we do as an accreditor is, you know, we're looking for innovation. We're looking for ways to embrace it and support it and share best practices because the, the lessons that Zach has learned will inform us when we look at our standards next time and update them because we're taking those best practices and we're putting them out there in our standards at a glance so people can see, oh, wait, I didn't think about how I would use this for quality improvement. Oh, I didn't think about how I would use this for ac for access and for equity. And, and that's one of the things that we think is so important is we want to stay friends with you when we accredit you because we want to learn, continue to learn from you as you continue to learn. Accreditation shouldn't be, oh, on September 14th, you passed all of our check boxes. It should be you're an organization that is committed to quality. And we expect you to be that not just on September 14th, but on every 14th and every month and every day. Right, and, and a, few, a few things on that. So like you said, remote patient monitoring is really broken up, at least mainly in the industry, between what is value-based care and fee-for-service. So one model is really managing those chronic conditions, your doctor helping and keeping an eye on you. And I think that's one of the big differences between us and telehealth is that we're an extension of your doctor, giving you all these amazing tools to constantly manage that chronic condition you're going through. On the other end of the value-based care, what happens when you leave the hospital? For so many years, the system is, well, let's hope you don't come back. Now we have a way for those months and months after to constantly make sure whatever you came in for, we're treating that and making sure you're staying in the right threshold so you're not coming back to the hospital for that same thing. But another thing you mentioned was accessibility. And accessibility is one of the biggest challenges facing the entire RPM and I'm sure even telehealth industry in terms of it being either a tech heavy solution or people not having great cellular service, which I think a lot of us in big metropolitan areas can take for granted that these aren't things that everyone has access to. So that's also something that we really try and pride ourselves on at Vitrack is regardless of the community where you are, we're going to find a solution that we can make work for you. Whether it's through using cellular devices, giving you a less tech heavy option, we really try and make this really life-saving technology available to anyone, regardless of where you are. And then on your last point, which is staying, staying with your act. It's not just about, okay, you're accredited, now go. Your act, I think we talk maybe every, every other week, every few weeks, just checking in. How have you been? Oh, we'd love for you to come on and try this or do this thing. So it isn't just about getting an accreditation. It's also about growing a relationship because while you're interested in what we're doing here at Vitrack and, and really informing what it means to really be offering, when you say someone has full accreditation, what is that standard? What does that organization look like? For us also, it's being involved with an organization like URAC that really holds everyone to the highest standard and making sure we're constantly in that conversation to, making, to make sure that we're really meeting that standard. I think it's important that when we talk about the accreditation, one of the things that I hear about, and, and I dealt with accreditation for years, is is we tell people we don't sell consulting services. And people are like, well, wait, well, wait a minute, I, I kind of need some help in doing this. <laughs> and, and, and what I say is, well, see, somebody has sold you a bad model. Somebody has convinced you that you have to pay extra for consulting services so that you get better. And, and what we do at URAC is we consider the accreditation process to be educational. You know, if, if you sit down and you hand us your standard on, on patient identification and we go, you know, that's not that good. Here's a better one. You know, we're not charging you $200 an hour for consulting. We see that as part of the accreditation process is to help make you better. Our, our idea here is not to shame people. It's to share best practices. And, and, and when, when you do that and when you don't have the, the oh, wait, I got to get another 20 consulting hours out of you as we go through the accreditation process, you know, it's it, it changes the dynamic. Um, the first time I went to a, a conference with representing URAC, I, I was there with one of our, our customer relations managers and one of our clients came up and gave him a hug. And I thought for so many of the accreditors that I've dealt with in the past, the idea of giving the accreditor a hug was just this ridiculous notion. And, and it, it was because you make friends and, and, and you go through this process. The other thing is, is accreditation is meant to improve you. If you go through accreditation and you don't have to change anything, then you're either really high performing or you've got too soft of an accreditor. And an accreditor who passes everybody means they're not really checking anyone. And that, that was something that I loved about the process was really how collaborative it was, right? And, and I think everyone going in with the right intentions of we want to be the best that we can be for us, for our clients, for every patient on our service to really be at your ex level. You guys realized that with us and you really helped collaborate when there was something that may not have been as great as it can be. You went, okay, what if you did that way? What if you tweak this? What if you change that? 
that was something that I was, I was really, really proud of in the process to be working with such a cool organization with how collaborative you are and helping us be the best that we can be. So I want to, I'm going to keep us focused a little bit on accreditation and then we're going to go back to some other really hot topics I want to talk about. I want to make sure we get back to access to care and policy, but since we're on accreditation, we can keep us there for one more second and I ask you, Zach, um, what's happened to you post accreditation? Yeah, it's, I mean, the amount of doors that this is. Did you go to, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been one of the most amazing things that has happened for our organization because now we're not just a remote patient monitoring organization. We're not just out there. We're out there saying we are right now, at least as far as we know, the, the only, if not one of the very few people who have had a third party organization come in, tear through every single policy, procedure, clinical workflow, security protocol, every last bit and say, you have our full accreditation. And for us, Todd, this opened the door to some larger hospital systems, to some payers, to some really interesting clients that before they were not interested in really doing remote patient monitoring because it's, uh, we call it all the time, the wild, wild west right now. And so for you to come in and say, it's not the wild, wild west, we went through a very specific protocol and procedure to get this, this gold seal, this accreditation from your act that on, on every call they recognize it, they know your act. So that has allowed us to open up so many doors and those doors that we're opening up have so many people that really need this service and can really use this life-saving technology. So you've enabled us to do what we do best and to do it better and to give this technology to way more people because now the organizations have so much more trust in what we bring to the table. And for us, we just love knowing that what we're doing has that gold seal. So every patient that is on our system, we know is really getting the best care that we can possibly give them. There's a, a funny little story I just want to mention. So we're getting ready for this webinar and I went over to the Vitrack website because I wanted to, you know, sort of take a look at it and all this sort of stuff. They have at the top of their website, the Urec gold seal. If you scroll all the way down, they have it at the bottom of their website, the gold seal. And it, rem it reminded me that periodically we actually find organizations that have cut and pasted our gold seal and tried to put it on their website, implying that they were Urec accredited when they weren't. And so it's it's not just about the gold seal on your website. It's also about your name on our website. You can go to, to the Urec website. We have a directory up there and it lists the organization and it lists what they're accredited for and all those sort of things. Because it, it really is meant to be a, you know, people who know what they're doing, check this place out. You know, whether you say good housekeeping, whether you say better business bureau, I'm, probably shouldn't say any of the just for example you know it, it's it, it's that kind of endorsement that that you can trust and uh, and healthcare it's so difficult to know who you can trust these days because people can look like they know what they're doing and then you find out they don't know what they're doing and to go through the York accreditation means not only do you know what you're doing but you invested in the time to prove it to somebody who, who knew what they were looking for Zach, I remember talking to you shortly after you became accredited earlier this spring, and um, we talked about going through the URAC accreditation process. And as Sean said, we don't want to come in and be these big bad guys. Um, we are we are not, and none of our reviewers are. Um, and I recall you saying to me that the validation review was the most fun final exam you had ever taken. And I'm going to continue to quote that that you said that um, because you said that it was you know you got to show off, and it's a great way. And yeah, and, and for us, I, so much, so many of our team members have sacrificed so much time and effort and power into making Vitrack what it is. And we wanted to know that we really built something that was operating at the highest standard. So after all the time and effort that went into getting the URAC accreditation and really molding our company to be, to really be what it should be and operate at this really high standard, we got to that final exam and I was in school for like a decade between all the different programs that I've done. So I've taken many final exams. And this one, I remember going in and it, I felt just ready. I felt good about it. I had all my T's crossed, my I's dotted, even my lowercase J's dotted too. So we really, we really went in and I, I was excited for it. I know some of our team members were nervous, but I, I knew that what we built was incredible and I was proud of it. And it was really amazing to see that you felt the same way and in return gave us that full accreditation. Awesome. So we promised people we would actually talk about some of the challenges addressed here. Um, remote patient monitoring depends on some kind of internet or distance connectivity. Um, but let's talk about that, Sean, rural Iowa. 
Yes. I, I mean, I'm in here in Washington, D.C. I've got 5G internet, the thousand kilobytes coming out of my Wazoo videos. I can run movies, free movies at a time. But rural Iowa, probably not so much. Let's talk mm -hmm. about the limitations there. Um, and also the other element is not just tech access, but also tech literacy. So that person who may not know how to log onto a computer or who may not have a smartphone attached to them for 24 hours a day. Um, Sean, why don't you talk to us a little bit there about in some, what's the limitations and what are we seeing and how does remote patient monitoring, what it's needed to address some of those too? Well, I, I think it's incredibly important that we talk about flexibility and, and adaptation. Um, because, you know, when, when I look at, it's always funny, I see these cellular TV, the, the cellular phone ads, and, and I look at them and you, they have their coverage map. And, and I grew up in places that are still white on the coverage maps. I mean, there, there's not cell service or anything like that. Um, and, and, and that's what we've got in, in certain areas. We also have places that are on the coverage map, but they don't have coverage on their device or those sort of things. And I think that when we think about both telemedicine, telehealth, and, and remote patient monitoring, you need to work with organizations that can dial it up or dial it down and that invest in the education. Because if, if I were to hand my... Uh, my dad, who's 78, if I were to hand him an iPad, he, he probably would open the Facebook app and he would scroll for a little while and that sort of stuff, and that might be it. But if I were to hand him a, a medical device and say, hey, I need you to check your blood pressure, he could hurt himself. And, and so you, you really have to not just enable, you have to educate and you have to follow through and you have to make sure that it's working. And there are times, honestly, where the best you're going to do is a phone call. And there's other times where you're going to be able to give a, a device that has a cellular card in it and it will connect. There's other times where, you know, you might have to do something else and, and hardwire or broadband or those sort of things. But I, I think that's important to recognize that with innovation needs to come um, innovation, not just in the tools you offer, but in the way that you support the clients who need it. Um, because the, you know, the, the worst tool in the world is one someone can't use, whether it be a, a $10,000 computer or whether it be a $5 wrench. If you can't use use it, it's a waste of time in your hands. And so I, I think that, that you, you need to understand that not it's not one size fits all. It's not one, one size of team to support a person fits all. It has to be meeting people where they are with the tools that they have and the understanding that they have for the condition that they have so they get the best care that they can get. And you have to, have to understand that. And one of the things about URAC standards, which I, I just want to mention, is there's very few standards where, where we say, this is how you have to do this. We generally say, this is what you need to do. Tell us how you do it. Because to get too prescriptive in an accreditation is to force people in, in, into one pair of pants. And we got a lot of different sizes of people that we have to deal with. I want to make sure that our remote patient monitoring standards work in downtown New York City with a person who's a, an investment broker. And they also work with the farmers that I grew up taking care of. And, and we need to make sure that, and, and for all I know, the investment banker may be lousy with an iPad and the farmer may be fantastic, but we can't assume that until we actually check it out. So all of those things about patient engagement and enrollment and those sort of things are standards that we talk talk about and we say show us your solution not here is how you must do it well and and just to, and on those terms especially in terms of the challenges where our pm like you said the two biggest challenges one is access to technology the other one is technology literacy so to address the technology accessibility for us our our start was really focusing on people who don't really have access to technology don't have access to a really high level of technology and I had to balance that against my love of being a huge technology nerd, especially when it comes to medical technology. So for Vitrack, we understood exactly what you said. It is certainly not one size fits all. There are different solutions for different kinds of people. So our most heavy technology solution, for example, it is the most cutting edge you're going to find out there. It's got facial, it's got facial detection, vital signs. It's got every bell and whistle you can imagine, every mode that a doctor could conceivably get in touch with a patient, depending on how they like. So some patients might love an email, some might, might like a phone call, some might want a text message, whatever it is we can accommodate. But then from there, there's a whole other world of people who do like access to care, the people in those white broadband zones. So for those, we have a whole other solution that is really focusing on getting the most pertinent data in the least invasive way possible. And when it comes to that technology literacy, right, I think what we're forgetting is from a really high level, what are we asking a patient to do in order for remote patient monitoring to be successful? We are asking them to really develop and drastically change a behavior. 
We ask them to add something into their routine either every day or every few days so that we can monitor them. That's a big ask. And I think a lot of companies forget how big of an ask that is. So in order to do that well, the education has to be done really, really smoothly and really, really intentionally for whoever you're educating, right? What is their level? Are you just giving them a cellular device? Are you also giving them an app? Are you giving, it really does depend. So for us, education is everything. And not just education, it's follow-up education, making sure that we're connecting with them in the right way. What ways are they responding to? What ways aren't they responding to? Because if they're gonna work that hard to change their own behavior, we need to do the same on our end, do our due diligence and figure out how are we going to make it that pull as easy as we can on our end. So that way, once you, once you have a patient who you're making it as easy as possible for them to change their behavior and giving them their right solution, on our end, it's just as incumbent on us to really do our end of that and really make sure the pull on our end is as right as it can possibly be. And especially for your act, when we were going through that training, they didn't tell us one way is right or the other. What they would tell us is, how are you doing this? And we would sit there and really craft for each different population, for each different kind of mode we have to buy track. This is how we do it. And here's exactly why we believe it's the best way to do it. Yeah, I, I, one funny thing that just sort of came to mind. The other day I was, I was looking through some stories and that sort of stuff. And I saw a story about a person who was having eye pain. And they, they went into the, the ophthalmologist's office and they, they had an examination done. And it turned out they had 27 contact lenses in one eye because they had been given daily lenses and not been instructed how to remove them. And, and I, I think that when, when you think about healthcare and those sort of things, you know, y you can't just assume they know it. You have to, you have to see how somebody uses it. You have to see what they're doing. You have to have that communication because, uh, you know, it used to be that we said, you know, doctors wrote orders. Uh, when it comes to outpatient medicine, you write suggestions and, and you really have to educate and convince people that there's, there's something that they need to be doing to change the trajectory of their health. So exactly. Let's talk a little bit about policy, because we know policy, Medicaid, billing, fee for service, all plays a role in this. So I'm going to ask you for set the stage, um, Sean, what what voices are currently at the table talking about this? And then and who needs to be at the table? Who's missing? Because we know um, I've said this before, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So who's at the table and who's about to get eaten for dinner? Well, I, I think, you know, it's very interesting. I mean, I, I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago at HIMSS um, about to telehealth and policy and those sort of things. And, and, and when the pandemic hit, all of these limitations were just thrown out the window when it came to telemedicine and telehealth and remote patient monitoring and all these sort of things. You know, there were the licensure restrictions, there were the payment restrictions, there was, you know, payment parity got put into place. I think there were like 50 or 60 different initiatives that were done to make it easier to practice remotely. And, and what we're seeing now is as the world returns to more normal, uh, depending upon where you are, that, that some of those policies are getting put back on, some of those restrictions are getting put back on, whether it be in, in licensure, whether it be in payment, whether it be in uh, credentialing networks, all those sort of things, that those controls are getting put back on. And, and, and some places where they've been put back on, they've been taken back off because people are like, we really think this makes a difference. We think this makes an opportunity. And, and everybody who is passionate about this now needs to work to be at the table. And, and that working to be at the table can be with speaking with your local legislators. It can be with speaking with your congressmen, speaking with your senators, because the effect of a local person speaking to a representative is huge. If you've never done it, you're missing out because they actually want to hear from you. It's one thing for me to go over to Congress and to say, hey, Senator from uh, Idaho, this is what we're seeing. It's another thing for someone from Idaho to speak to the Senator's office from Idaho and talk about how remote patient monitoring or telehealth has made a difference in their world. And so, so talk to your people, make sure that you understand what's going on. If you have advocacy groups that you're part of, you know, make sure that, you, that you're speaking with them and sharing your experiences, because just because it's important to you doesn't mean it's important to everybody else. And so this is a time where a lot of these things are coming back on. One of the tips that I will say is that if you're hearing people talk about fraud, waste, and abuse in telehealth or remote patient monitoring, look for them to decrease its use. If you're hearing people talk about improving access and improving quality and equity, look for them to increase the use. So whatever your people are saying kind of tells you the way that they're leaning. But all of these rules are going to come back, well, not all these rules, some of these rules are going to come back on federally. So you actually probably have more of a chance to intervene at the state level to, to have rules stick around that benefit people. 
Wow. Yeah. And, and I, I, exactly what you said. And I think one of the things that gets missed here is the people at that high level making the policy. The policy determines the entire way the industry is going to flow. So for example, Medicare creating rules for RPM. This was the first time almost ever that they created different, different codes that really went to wellness policy, right? For proactively managing someone's health and catching those first moments. And once that happened, it really shifted an entire industry. So the people making these decisions have immense power. But what does get missed in translation is bringing the patient voice to the table, really having the patient, the person who's gonna be on that device, the person who's gonna be re being reached out to, making those different phone calls, bringing them to the table and hearing their voice and what makes those policies important or what makes them the most right they can be is something that does get missed. And especially as people who work with those patients constantly, we find that sometimes the codes don't accurately reflect what is providing the best care, what's providing the most meaningful care, and can sometimes just lead to arbitrary, hey, you need to do it this way because we said so. So that's why for us, really what you said, advocacy is huge. Making sure that when new codes come out, that you are lobbying the codes, that you are bringing that patient voice to the table. Having people with that patient voice on your team and hearing them out, so that way you can actually adapt different procedures. And, and like you said, Sean, you reminded me of a story back when back from my nonprofit days is I was volunteering in Uganda for a few months and we came back and we went to DC because we heard there was a bill called the Farm Bill that was on the table. The Farm Bill sounds great if you're a senator. It was to send a bunch of food to Uganda. That sounds great, except for you, when you realize that most of the people out in the rural areas in Uganda, that's how they make all of their money. So if you're going to provide yeah. the only the thing for free that people make money on, you're going to collapse an entire economy. Yeah. So we went, a group of us from that trip, put on our fanciest suits and went all over Capitol Hill, knocking door to door to senator to senator and letting them know, hey, we were on the ground. Here's what the effect that policy will be. And they actually, it never got through the farm bill. So your voice and bringing the voice to the table, especially a patient voice, really does have huge implications and can make the people at the top who really drastically affect which way the industry goes, you can actually have them have much more inclusive and intentional policies to really increase the, the largest amount of healthcare, most meaningful healthcare that we can give to the population. Yeah, I, th I think people sometimes forget that good intentions don't always lead to good results. Yes. And, and, and one of the reasons why we're here in DC is because we, we believe that we, we need to advocate. And, and years ago, I was helping to run population health. And I said, I could have 2000 physicians doing the right thing. And then somebody puts a comma in the wrong place in a bill, and it throws it out the window. And, and, and that's what we're dealing with now. I mean, when we, when we talk about trillion dollar programs and billions of dollars for this and billions of dollars for that, you know, that determines where industries go and, and the care that people receive. And, and if, if you see the value in innovation, you have to advocate for that innovation to stick around because, because we learned a lot during the pandemic. We learned things that do work and things that don't work. And we want the good stuff to stick around. Sean. Guys, I want to go into a good question here. Um, we've talked about patient adoption. Let's talk about physician adoption. This is coming up. Karthik's asking, you know, providers want to, they need to bill. That's, and we know that they need to bill. How do they handle billing if it handled separately? And we know some of this is up in the air as it relates to telehealth billing. Is it the same as an in-person visit? Where does billing come into this? And how do you, um, what's the conversation that needs to be had with providers who want to be recognized for the work they're doing? I actually want Zach to answer that one because Zach lives the billing more than I live the billing on some of these things, and I don't want to get it wrong and embarrass myself. So, so Zach, how would you answer that? Gosh, well, I can I can speak to certainly much more the remote patient monitoring. We do offer telehealth as part of our solution. We always like to say that for RPM, telehealth is just a piece of this puzzle. It is not the entire puzzle or the whole thing. But we do offer that just as part of our service. And then if the physician does want to bill for that, we can help them. But that's not really the bread and butter of RPM. And just before I get into this, I would like to say there is a whole other side of RPM, which is not based on the codes. What we say is we go to a hospital or a large health system and we say, by having your patients on our program, we're going to be able to catch those moments where they start to not be healthy anymore and intervene there to keep them healthy and out of the hospital. So it's a value. It's really we're saving you money downstream, right? And so that patient coming in needing all those costly interventions and the different things, once they get in the hospital, we're going to save you all that money by keeping them out of the hospital. So that is one way that RPM does work. But on the other end of it, when we get to the CPT codes, right? It really does depend. We, we do not bill because we are not the physician. It has to be billed 
through the physician, through their MPI. So the way that works is we provide them the technology and the service, but what we do offer is we make it easy, right? You have these codes, the two really big ones that I'm sure most people are familiar with is you gotta get that 16 readings in the 30 day period and monitor for 20 minutes over a calendar month. But a physician and their staff is not gonna have time to sit there and count up each one and go through an Excel spreadsheet, none of that. We make it as easy as possible. So we have an entire billing suite built into our software so that way, the moment a patient hits 99454, they get those 60 readings, you're going to get a check and you're going to see when it was downloaded, when it was read, when it was sent out to be billed for, and how much it was billed for. Then on the other end, that 20 minutes, what did you do during those 20 minutes? What was the monitor? A full comprehensive list of every single second that happened in that 20 minutes. For us, keeping the doctor safe and making sure their license is held in the highest esteem and that we only bill Medicare, but we know we are, we have way more evidence than even necessary to really protect their license. That's for us, the most important thing is protect, protecting physician licenses. So when it does come to the billing, we'll give you all the evidence you could possibly need, but the, but the physician does have to actually do the billing. So, so let, let me run into a couple of things here. As, as a former physician, uh, billing is the Rosetta Stone that everybody keeps trying to figure out. And the government keeps moving things and changing codes and adding a decimal point and a fifth digit and all this sort of stuff. And so it's incredibly tricky. And it depends upon where you are, the plan that you're dealing with, all these sort of things come into play here. Now, what Zach and his team have done is they, they have tried to idiot proof it as best they can, which means they have underestimated the idiots that they might have to deal with, uh, is, is the, the old joke. That I, that I used to say as a CMIO, what you've got is you've got payments and, and you have to have somebody who's fluent in payments, okay? They have to know in your system, in your office, all those sort of things, how you do it, how you handle it with your EMR, how you handle it with your clearing house. Is your clearance house, you know, cutting digits off and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, so, so all of those controls are coming back on after the public health emergency, depending upon where you are, they're dependent upon your state, they're dependent upon your contracts. So we could have a six day symposium just on billing for these sort of things. Within, within telehealth and telemedicine, those are some of the things that are going on right now. Some payers are still paying for it, some payers are not paying for it. I think that, that the, the leaning of, of activity is towards increasing payment with some controls on it. And that's what we really, you know, if, if, if you see somebody walking down the street holding a sign that says payment parity for telehealth, health, I, I think they're simplifying the question away from being meaningful because there's some things in telehealth that are worth paying the same. There's other things where you can't really make a case. Surgery via telehealth is not something I would pay the same as being in an operating room, but there's good evidence for behavioral health via telehealth that, that probably should be equivalent payment. With remote patient monitoring, if you have a value-based care arrangement where you're caring for a population, then, then something like remote patient monitoring really makes sense quickly from avoiding one hospitalization in a population it's like well there we just paid for that month and 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 you really need to deal with organizations that understand if you're looking at the fee for service pull the lever get a dollar then then that's a lot tougher to do um, there are ways to do that some of the time but it's really about you if if you could bill for it and it was making care worse you shouldn't be doing it if it's making care better and you're having challenges billing for it work through the challenges because it's worth it to the patient Awesome. Um, I want to be aware of time and I am going to share our contact info in just a second. But I always like to ask our panelists and Sean, you've heard this from me many times. What's the what's the future of remote patient monitoring? Um, Zach, you're in this. You're probably doing strategic plans, have your five and 10 year plan out. What are you what are you looking at? What are you preparing for? And then Sean, I'll give it to you to close out the webinar. So I, I think you can kind of segment this into what are my hopes for the industry or what are what is the data showing where the industry is going to go? So I would say that just based on the data and what we're seeing throughout the entire remote patient monitoring industry is that we are giving better care and we are saving lives and we are keeping people out of the hospital. So I think at some point, especially having been in med school for a little bit myself, I think this will be something that will become the norm. You'll be taught in school what is the best way to proactively deal with the patient's health, not just reactively. I remember from my time, they would give me a case and they'd be like, here you go, go with your classmates and solve this case with this insane disease and all these things. And I remember every single time it became a joke, my first question would always be the same. It would be, how did they get that bad? How did we let the patient get this bad? And so really making that a focus, not just in education, but almost, and this might be a strong word, but compulsory. 
or even just the norm for a physician who is really treating you well, right? A physician is a healthcare provider. They provide healthcare to a patient. And to do that well, you must have a patient on something like remote patient monitor, regardless of the status, because sickness comes when we least expect it, when we most do, it, it just comes. And it's hard to predict, but here's the thing, you can predict it with the technology we have now, and that technology is only gonna get better. So I think it will start to become much more standard, if not compulsory. On the other end of this, this is why we've invested in some really cool technology is, I think it will become even more past I think you're going to see the vitals gathering part of this just get more and more and more past. What do I mean by that? For example, right now, the standard way to take uh, pulse socks is you got to clip a thing on your finger. You got to sit there and wait. We've invested in technology that allows you to take vital signs just using your camera. So that's just holding up your phone like this. And in under a minute, we got your pulse socks and we got your heart rate and we got a stress level and we've got your respirations. But these technologies are only going to get more and more passive. It's about gathering these data points, these vitals without bothering the patient at all. So I think you're gonna see those technologies really, really start to ramp up and become really, really cool for lack of better words. I'm a bit of a nerd, so I get excited thinking about what that might look like. And then on the other end of that, I think and this is my hope for the industry, is I think we're going to see the patient's voice be brought to, this tab to the table a lot more. If you're out there in the Twitterverse, if you're out there on LinkedIn, and you're out there with the people in this community who are really trying to advocate and innovate in this new field that is focusing the shift away from sick care to well care, what you're seeing is people constantly talking about the patient voice. We've got to get the patient's voice in here. Is 60 readings in the 30-day period really relate to them adhering? And is 20 minutes of monitoring, is that really showing that you're caring for that patient? All these different codes. I think what you're going to see is a shift in the codes to something that really much more accurately reflects what really good well care actually does. So those are my predictions and hopes for the future of the RPM industry. So, so my predictions, I think there will be a slow crawl forward um, driven by advocates and innovators who see the opportunity and who not just seize the opportunity, but tell the story of the opportunity. Because very often change in medicine requires that people see the benefit in a compelling way. And I, I think that extending it to underserved areas, to underserved populations, uh, you know, whether it be disaster stories, those sort of things, I think those are the places where things change. I think that, that you have to have advocates see um, what I don't want is I don't want Zachary's company eventually to be reduced to where they're just taking a look at video camera meetings where you're rating your <laughs> your uh, business competitors blood pressure based upon their picture on their video screen or something like that mm -hmm. I, I think that we have to realize that that we had this huge experiment during the COVID pandemic where we tried all of these things and we learned a lot of lessons and and some of those lessons are worth keeping and they will be kept if people stand up and say this matters to me I think it's going to be more popular and value based care value-based payment arrangements because that changes the fee-for-service dynamics but i think that you've also created a huge suite of of early adopters who can be evangelists for the possibility that this could hold for improving the care of patients and and keeping them out of one of the most dangerous places in the world which is the u.s hospital system um, I, I think that we have to recognize that that not all care has to be in a sanitized environment uh, shoulder to shoulder with other sick people Wow. Yeah, very good. Exactly. And I think the last thing I'd like to add on that is with all of those different things moving forward and hopefully faster than a slow crawl is that as the technology gets better and this does become more compulsory, the access to this kind of care will be, will be not even a thought. It will be for everyone, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, possibly even on the planet. That would, that would also be a big hope of me. Sean and Zach, it's always a pleasure to have this conversation. The hour flew by. Thank you to everyone who joined us for today. Um, we hope you had a great time. Our contact info is in the screen and my colleagues have been posting it in the chat box. We hope you'll follow us on LinkedIn, on Twitter. You can follow Zach on LinkedIn and Vitrack on Twitter there. And if you're interested in any of our programs, you can take our two question quiz to figure out which accreditation program is best suited for your organization. Thank you all for participating and this officially concludes our webinar.